The 12th Kaifenshaw National Scenic and Historic Trails is brought to you by the Bureau of Land Management, the National Park Service, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the National Forest Service. Legislation somehow, um, it would help to, you know, expand the the ground that we have. I think is to put this somehow bridge the partnerships and the whoever you know manages the trails into um, somehow written into this policy. And so that's kind of something I want to go on to work with more. So, but that's an idea. So. I can tell you that it's not just um, myself, but I'm catching here, I have one person in the back, that um, I'll purchase things according to the post-consumer content on there. And I know that my siblings who are 10 and 12 also love it when they see that little recycling stamp on the corner and it says that this was um, recycled. So don't just preach the green, but be green yourselves, and that can draw attention to you in a very positive way. So, Hi. Um, excuse me, I'll slow down. Of microphones. Uh, my name is Lani Dombolski, and I'm a graduate student at the University of Oregon. Um, and I have two suggestions. I think uh, a few of you have heard the second one I'll go through. I'm a graduate student in landscape architecture, which is, of course, very allied with uh, trails. And um, my thoughts with my master's projects have really had to do with um, our physical physically connecting trails into urbanized areas and kind of starting to create curiosity about trails through that connection. Can the can a trail, a wilderness trail, go all the way into town? Can it go into your downtown park? Um, you know, is there a way to create some sort of mysterious interpretive elements that are going to carry somebody out of town on that? I mean, I think that's a really subtle um, I don't want to say manipulative, but I think curiosity-inspiring way, positive, yes, positive manipulation, um, to get people curious and excited about these systems, you know, it's not just about driving your car there, um, you know, can you bike to a trailhead? Um, I know that the, the one, I, one thing I thought about was when I was reading about the Ice Age Trail um, and some of the towns, they do pickups for hikers who need to do resupplies. Well, um, I lived in Boulder, Colorado for a while, and there's this system called the Pink Bike, where it's basically a community bicycle. If there's a pink bike and it's unlocked, you can go pick that bike up, and you can ride it anywhere you want. Well, can we have bikes from the trailhead to town if it's only two miles to town? Because I've done a couple, I've hiked a couple long-distance trails now, and tell you, going 10 miles out of your way on foot, that's two days, you know, and you know, maybe it's part of the experience, but I think that trying to, to think, um, sorry for the cliche, outside of the box, but really thinking of it, of the trail experience is not just about walking, but maybe it's about several forms of transportation. My, my friend and I actually biked here from Eugene, and uh, we took so many modes of transportation, we, you know, we rode our bikes, of course, and we hitchhiked, and we took ferries and we got a ride in a Cessna and you know, how many how 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 much is you know trail about experiencing wildlife or, or the historic aspect and how much of it is about experiencing the culture of America or New Zealand or wherever it is I'm hiking. So um, I think again thinking about those really physical connections of the trails to populated areas and also we know that those are gonna reap uh, economic benefits for those areas as well. Um, the other one, um, most people who met my friend Amy, who's not in this room, I think she's at the protection, one of the protection seminars, um, and I, a lot of people have asked us if we were scholarship recipients, and we had to keep saying, no, we're too old, we're graduate students, and I think um, we got funding from the University of Oregon to come here anyway, so we made it. Um, but I think the idea of expanding the definition of what of what youth is is really important because um, as graduate student in landscape architecture, there are maybe 30 people who are graduate students in my program, and I know of one who's a, a two now who are under the age of 25. Um, and most of us are in points in our careers where we're shifting from one uh, career path to another. And so, um, the, the, and for me, that kind of um, also, it's not just about recruiting for these conferences, but it's also thinking about when you're targeting youth. I've heard people talk about educating elementary school children a lot and kids pulling their parents onto the trails. Well, um, as I'm approaching 30, a lot of my friends are starting to have children. And so actually marketing 
these youth programs or family programs uh, to young families, I think, is really important because I, I live in self-selected communities where everybody's a hiker. But um, coming from the D.C. area, as uh, Jeray yeah, was saying, I didn't hike until I was 23, and now I can't stop. So it's uh, just expand those, those definitions. Thank you very much. You now I saw a hand over here, and, and really we promised to go 10 minutes later, and we're on that cusp. So if anybody feels the need to scatter, please do, but I'd love to keep the conversation going as long as we can. Thank you. Uh, I'm Ken Garkula, assistant, acting assistant director for the Recreation for the Forest Service. Jonathan works so uh, for me, and I want to say first, Jonathan really wishes he could have been here, but for some very serious reasons he can't. But what I think I can say about him, he would just be jumping for joy right now. I mean, he's kind of an emotional guy at times. He might even be crying right now in the way this is all going, and that's the truth. And it gives me response also, because I come from a generation with the Forest Service, one of the last real hires when there was a big hiring boom in the Forest Service, and that was the late 70s, early 80s. Okay. I got three more weeks and I'm eligible for retirement. I'm not going to take it yet, but that kind of shows you where the white hair comes out. I think the comment earlier about you folks are the leaders, you are the point is right. You've shown it, it doesn't go away. You are going to be the next me. Okay. Sitting in Washington, D.C., and when you say something, I can make some things happen, okay? And you will be making things that can happen across the nation. And you are going to be there. I can just tell you. I can see it. I'm going to be part of a group talk about a little bit more about the hiring and things and all that kind of stuff. Get out for the job today, but I can definitely hopefully try to give you some uh, ideas and stuff. But one thing I did want to pick up on is the second piece. A good friend from Alabama who uh, now, I got some good friends that we talk about sitting on the porch and having lead wipes all sitting on the Who amongst us does not enjoy NASCAR? I do, and I'm, and I'm from Arizona. <laughs> okay. uh, but I think there's two things going on here. There's one, the development of you as next generation leaders, NGLs. We'll throw that out because I'm starting with next generation leaders. Okay. For the, the federal agencies or any of the natural resource agencies or its partners. But what we really are struggling with is the component, uh, the, the term that was used in the Forest Service, and maybe after hearing kids, maybe uh, we might have changed it to, to another, but kids in the woods, the whole aspect of getting people to reconnect with the outdoors, not so much as leadership, but to come work for the natural resource agencies. How do we connect global climate change? What does that really mean? To them, they really understand what that means. How are we going to do it? And I think what I'm hearing from you, from you folks is that you have some ideas, and I really do believe that we, or my peers, are struggling with how to make this connection. You are going to be a godsend to us. And I will also say, in the Washington office, and I'm starting to hear about it now from other things, this year, I don't know if I've been blind or something about this year in regards to people of your age groups. Abigail and her uh, uh, fellows uh, that are in their internships, things, there just seems to be more of a happy this year than I've ever seen. It's called the OA election. Maybe it is the OA election or whatever, whatever it is. Maybe that is what it is. And if that is, great, wonderful, because now that your presence is there, I've seen smiles on us old gray hairs types of things bringing our hack sacks out of us. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and we have quite a few other little uh, toys that we used to play with back in the 60s and 70s. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we, we really do have uh, our kid youth coming out of us right now. So thank you very much for that. It's been coming through great. So we'll keep it on, we'll keep going. I don't know what the right words are, but yeah. <laughs> Jeannie, I know there's a lot of enthusiasm, but I'd like to, we've only got 15 minutes before the plenary begins, and I'd like to say, check out the partnership website and see that blog and contribute that way, because I know this conversation is going to continue long into the future. Perhaps this will be our legacy, so Jeannie. Yeah, and I'll just be uh, quick, but I want to piggyback on what Ken was saying. Um, Keep hearing about Jonathan Stevens, and 
for those of you who have not met him, when you do, you're just going to love him. And you will meet him. He, he'll be, he's in this community. He's in the middle of this community. Um, and I've been talking to Jonathan frequently uh, throughout the, uh, the conference, and um, he is thoroughly inspired, as am I, as are these folks who are deeply, deeply touched me. I just want to say thank you. You guys are so cool, and thanks for presenting me. years into the career thing, and this is completely, completely energizing. Um, on a related note, when I keep getting pulled out of meetings and on the phone, um, Jonathan right now and I today are working on our um, uh, 2010 national budget and budget allocation, and I think it's fairly safe to say that the Forest Service is committing to um, increasing their funding definitely next year towards shepherding this, this initiative. So thanks. curb that enthusiasm, but I know that we have a lot to look forward to in the evening program. So I'd like to thank all of our panelists and thank all of our participants. This has been a truly really amazing discussion. The 12th Conference on National Scenic and Historic Trails is brought to you by the Bureau of Land Management, the National Park Service, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the National Forest Service.